chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 12, Philippians 1 and 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of, Lord, word of God more courageously and fearlessly. We'll move on down to verse 18. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. For if I, am going on, for if I go on living in the body, this will mean, mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again your joy in Jesus Christ will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you're standing firm in one spirit, contending as one man with the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just pray. Father, as we meet in your presence together this morning, in circumstances we would never have expected, I pray that you will speak into each one of our hearts and lives. And I pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you will uphold me, that Jesus Christ may be uplifted. In his name I pray. Amen. Well, I wonder how you are feeling this morning. No doubt some of us here are in shock at what we have just heard at the beginning of our time together this morning. Uh, I suspect not many of us expected that we'd be hearing something like that this morning. Uh, maybe some of us did, but I suspect not many. I certainly didn't. And I wonder if you have ever gone through the experience of losing a loved one or a very close friend uh, through death, and how you filtered that, how we cope with that, how we deal with it. Because I think in some parts of the church today, and I, I cannot see where this comes from in the Bible, there seems to be a strand of teaching that it's not right for Christians to grieve. It's not right for Christians to have a broken heart. It's not right and indeed unbiblical for Christians to weep or to sorrow. And I just don't know which Bible people are reading when they say that. Because actually, at a time like this, it is normal, it is human, it is the way God has made us that we feel our hearts are broken, because they are. That our hearts go out to the family of the bereaved, to Mandy and the children and the wider family. We're distressed. We can feel 
utterly broken. Indeed, sometimes when we lose a loved one, we just feel we can't go on. What's the point in going further? And yet the Bible is full of promises to the people of God going through tough times. We've heard that wonderful promise this morning from the Psalms, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. The psalmist doesn't need to write that if we're never brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. And that's the way some of us feel at a time like this, totally crushed. We feel numb. For others, um, we don't feel numb. We don't feel anything at all because that's our way of coping. We are all different, praise God. Wouldn't it be terrible if everybody was just like you or just like me? We actually need each other, and we will cope with things in different ways. We will deal with things in different ways, and we need to understand that so that we can help and encourage each other and stand with each other at a time like this. Yes, it's totally in line with the teaching of the Bible and the experience of the people of God that we mourn. Did not Jesus himself say in the most famous sermon ever preached, blessed are those who mourn? For what? See, here's the key. They shall be comforted. Yes, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to weep. It's interesting in this letter of Paul to the Philippians, and I'm going to be referring to this this evening, he refers to a good friend called Epaphroditus, chapter, uh, chapter 2. And he says this in verse 26 in chapter 2, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus longs for all of you and is distressed because, he, because you heard he was ill. Now, you see, there's an interesting thing a leader in the early church, a servant of God, and he was ill. His health wasn't what it should have been. That doesn't fit with some people. And then look at verse 27 in chapter 2. Indeed, he was ill. Paul is saying to the folks, you haven't had fake news. You've heard the truth. He really was ill, and in fact, he almost died. And how does Paul say he would feel about that had he died? Paul says this, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. There's the truth. What Paul is saying is, if my really good friend Epaphroditus had died, I would have been filled with sorrow. So, folks, it is normal, it is natural, it is part of the experience of the people of God that there are times in our lives when we have broken hearts, when we sorrow, when we mourn. And sometimes, like many of us here this morning, we are totally and utterly shocked because it's not what we expected. Death can happen suddenly, unexpectedly, or death can happen really at something that's been building up over a period of time because someone has been very ill and the family know what the outcome's going to be of this and the friends know and so on. So in a way, we're kind of preparing for this as we walk through this illness with our family member or our friend. And often unconsciously then, we're being prepared for the moment when death comes. But even in those circumstances, it's still hurts deeply. After I left school in my late teens, in July 1967, 68, I discovered that my mum had cancer. I often say two or three minutes in a doctor's surgery and your life is never the same again. And it was just mum and I at home, my dad was already dead, and the doctor said to me in that surgery in Hollywood one day, I'll never forget it, Dr. Donnan said to me, Kenneth, your mother has six months to live. And he was right almost to the day. And she suffered horrendously with cancer at that time. Thank God the treatment is so much better now than it was then. So I was getting prepared for when this day would come, and it happened on Boxing Day 68. Although I was preparing myself, it hurt deeply. 
and I had a broken heart. So I know what I'm talking about from personal experience, from the experience of the people of God. You see, it is right to grieve. It's human to grieve. It's natural to grieve. In fact, Jesus did it. Do you remember how he responded at the grave of his friend Lazarus? What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. The tears ran down the cheeks of the Son of God because of the death of his friend. Friends, there's nothing to be ashamed of in having a broken heart. When a much-loved pastor is called to go home, and it's something we weren't really expecting, well, that's a set of circumstances that we have to deal with. But do you know one of the big differences? We don't sorrow as those without hope. That's the teaching of the Bible. And also, we're not alone in this. Do you remember what Jesus said? And this is what I think we need to get into our minds and hearts in the church today, because some people don't seem to believe this. They seem to believe and teach that if we're disciples of Jesus, we're going to be floating on a hallelujah cloud 24-7. We'll never have a problem. We'll never have a difficulty. Every piece of the jigsaw puzzle will just fall into place so beautifully and naturally and seamlessly. Friends, life isn't like that. It's not what Jesus taught. It's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus said to his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. That's not fake news. That is real news. If you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ and followers of the Son of God, we've signed up for trouble, folks. Now, I'm sorry. I know I'm meant to be a messenger of good news. That is part of the gospel. We will suffer for him. Paul referred to that in the passage that we read here this morning. Look at the end of Philippians chapter 1. It has been granted to you on behalf, on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. It's part of the discipleship package. Jesus couldn't have made it clearer. In this world, you will have trouble. Interestingly, in the last few days, just a few days ago in the United States, quite a well-known pastor died. And uh, just last night, my wife came across something that his wife had written. Just listen to this. To my Andrew, because that was his Christian name, it's only been three days, that's three days since he died, Nothing can take away the suffocating pain I feel now you are gone. I miss every part of you. I see you everywhere. If you have gone through bereavement and loss, you'll identify with those words. If it's someone you have loved with all your heart, you know what this pastor's wife is talking about. But that's not where it finishes, and we'll see that later. Because what did Jesus go on to say? In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. The church of Jesus Christ is the Easter people. We are people not only of the cross, but of the resurrection. Surely one of the most famous sermons of the latter part of the 20th century, and you'll be delighted to hear this, was preached by a Baptist. And some of you will know the title of it. And he preached it like this. It's Friday, but Sunday is it coming. Oh, I wish I could preach like that sometimes. But that's the way he went on. It's Friday, but Sunday is it coming. You see, there is a cross. There is the suffering. There is the pain. But what happens next in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the life of the Son of God? Resurrection, the empty tomb, the body has gone. He has been raised from the dead. Praise God. So you see, we sorrow, we grieve, we weep. 
But the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is this. We do not grieve without hope. Undergirding it all is the hope and the certainty of resurrection. Thank God. Is it any wonder then that Paul says in this passage that Gareth read for us, and I think this is one of, one of the key verses of the whole letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 27. Friends, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, in suffering, in the good times, in sickness, in illness, when we can pay the bills, when it's difficult to pay the bills, when the bits of the jigsaw are coming together, when the bits of the jigsaw are all over the place, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the gospel of Christ. The call on every disciple of Jesus is to live worthily. And in this church, you have had the privilege of seeing in John Lewis, your pastor, someone who has lived worthily for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go into these first few things this morning because of the change of circumstances, but these are some of the points that Paul makes as he writes to the Philippians. But I want us just for a few moments to focus on that last one. Part of living worthily for Christ is that we begin to filter everything that happens to us through different glasses, kingdom glasses, kingdom lenses. We don't see things the way other people do because we really believe what we were singing a few moments ago. There is a sovereign God who's with us in the fire and in the flood. He's there all the time. He walks through it with us. When the gale is howling and the personal problems we're facing are Himalayan, Christ the risen Lord is with us in this and walks with us. Those who are older will know that Him, He walks with me and He talks with me. That is the truth. So living worthily for Christ means 24-7, not just when all's going the way we want it to go. And of course, Paul is the supreme example of what he's just talking about here. It's fascinating in these verses that Gareth read for us that several times Paul uses this phrase, what has happened to me? What has happened to me? Verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Look at verse 19. I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Well, what had happened to Paul? Well, there's a clue because several times in this first chapter, he refers to being in chains. He's a prisoner. He's been arrested. And what happened in the lead up to this arrest? Well, I'll tell you. He faced false accusation. He faced mob violence. He had been stripped and stretched out to be tortured. He had been illegally assaulted for he was a Roman citizen and some people didn't know the law. So there was an injustice in what had happened to him. He had faced an assassination plot. There were people who wanted with Paul, get rid of him. He was a threat. He ended up in the hands of a tyrant. He was shipwrecked on the way to Rome. Now, some of you have enjoyed wonderful cruises. When the wind got a bit stronger, how did you feel? Shipwreck is something completely different. He'd been through that. And now he's in prison. He's in chains. But what are his kingdom filters and lenses? Look at what he says. 
He's saying, what has happened to me is actually serving to advance the gospel. It's encouraging other people to witness. Look at verse 13. As a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become, have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. In other words, what Paul is saying is this, my circumstances are not what I would choose, but I'm going to see these circumstances through kingdom lenses, and I'm recognizing that God is in this, and God is going to work His purposes out, even in the heartbreak and the disappointment and the change of plans and the unexpected things happening. And folks, in the midst of this unexpected news that we have received this morning, can we dare to put on the kingdom lenses and really believe, even if we can't see the big picture or even part of the picture, can we dare to believe the truth of what we've just been saying, that our God is sovereign, and for some reason unknown to us, this was His time for John to go home. That's the way Paul interprets circumstances and events that he's going through. What he's doing is simply this, putting it in language we can really understand. He just gets on with the job, whether he's in plenty or in want. Read Philippians 4. He's learning to be content, and he's going to keep pressing on sharing in the fellowship of suffering, as well as in resurrection hope. Over the next few hours and days and weeks, we all will have choices to make. We're going to choose to believe really in a God who's sovereign, or are we going to allow circumstances to crush us? distract us, potentially wipe us out. Do you know that the palace guard that Paul, Paul refers to here in verse 13, they were the kind of crack soldiers of those days. And it's highly likely that Paul would have been chained to one of those soldiers for eight hours a day. Now, for those of you who love your space, how would you feel about somebody being in close proximity like that for eight hours every day? That would be tough. And yet, what's he doing? He's witnessing to these people. He's sharing Christ. And they know he's not in chains because he's murdered somebody or stolen money, but he's in chains because of Christ, the one who means so much to him. Paul wasn't in that prison saying, oh, why did this happen to me? I really wish things were different. I wish I was in a different place. No, he's making the most of every opportunity. And that's God's call on you and on me, to filter circumstances through kingdom lenses, and to make the most of every opportunity. Look at chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And we thank God this morning for the privilege of knowing someone like Pastor John Lewis, who modeled what Paul's writing about here pressing on towards the goal to win the prize for which God 
has called him heavenwards. You see, some of us think, oh, if only I was somewhere else, I would be serving God so well. Isn't that right? Oh, if only I was like him or like her, things would be so different for me, so much easier. But it's not like that. No, God wants us to bloom and blossom where we're planted, being a witness for him in whatever circumstances we are in, and filtering the circumstances through his kingdom glasses. We've all heard of Billy Graham, haven't we? Have you ever heard of Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball lived decades and decades before Billy Graham. But through a whole historical sequence, and there isn't time to go into it this morning, Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher of the famous D.L. Moody, led him to Christ. Through D.L. Moody, another person led to Christ, another per through the person who led Billy Graham to Christ, it was part of that line that started with the Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball. This is the way God works, folks. When we are faithful in the circumstances to which he has called us. I love this. I came across it recently. You may not be able to actually read it out, but you'll see a, a disabled uh, Chinese runner there on the white top, and a Kenyan elite runner passes water to him because the disabled Chinese runner has become dehydrated. He was really suffering, and this superb elite Kenyan runner gives him some of her water. Because she did this, she came in second in the race, and she actually forfeited winning $10,000 in cash. But you see, she had a different set of values. She wasn't motivated primarily and exclusively by that competitive spirit. She threw her circumstances through a different filter. Some athletes wouldn't have done that because they'd have lost 10,000 bucks and they'd have finished higher up in the race. But different lenses kicked in, folks. What about you and what about me? What are our values? What are our priorities this morning? And do you remember the pastor's wife I told you about who's just heartbroken at her husband dying a few days ago? Just listen to how she finished this blog or letter she wrote. To my Andrew, it's only three days. Nothing can take away the suffocating pain. I feel now you're gone. I miss every part of you. I see you everywhere. Do you see how her blog finished? Because you are close to me, she quotes Psalm 16, verse 8. Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken. For I experience your wraparound presence every moment. Brother, sister in Christ, one of the greatest privileges you and I have is that we are engulfed in the wraparound presence of the Almighty God. Pastor John is safe in the arms of Jesus, the Jesus who will hold him fast, never let him go, and if we're following that same Christ, that's true of us as well. You know, the old hymn writer got it right. The work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. When we place our trust in the risen, crucified Lord Jesus Christ, nothing, nothing, nothing will separate us from his love. Have you got that confidence this morning? Is that where our trust is? Because what the Apostle Paul says is this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, we see this attitude in Christ Jesus. We see it throughout his life. As a young boy, what did he say at that temple? I must always be about my father's business. Total clarity. This is what I'm here for. And that's God's call on you and me. We're, we're to be here on earth to be about our heavenly Father's business. Do you remember the Garden of Gethsemane? None of us would choose to do, go there. 
go through the suffering that Jesus went through there. I have a theory that the cross was won in the Garden of Eden. Because what did Jesus pray there? Not my will, but yours be done. Total self-surrender. What's the prayer of so many people nowadays in 2018? Not thy will, but mine be done. Being a Christian is the opposite of that. It's about immersing ourselves in his will, just like John Lewis. What about you this morning? In a few moments, we're going to sing that wonderful Keith Getty hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast. But before we do, I want to ask you in all love and sincerity this morning, is he holding you fast? Honestly? Is your trust and my trust in the Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross? How did Norman finish that super tribute to John? Did he not say if John was here this morning, he might ask us two questions? Will you be joining me where I am? If not, can I encourage you to follow my Jesus today? Maybe for someone here this morning, today is your birthday. It's the beginning of a new life. We thank God for a dear brother and pastor who has gone to be with Christ, who is holding him fast. And today we want to know that same Lord and have that same security, build our lives on that same foundation, the foundation of the gospel, a gospel of forgiveness, a gospel of hope. So I'm just going to pray a simple prayer now. And I'm going to give you the opportunity, if you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to do it this morning right here and begin a new life with Christ as our Savior, Lord, and King. And we're going to begin to see circumstances differently, whatever happens. Let's just pray. just going to pray this prayer very slowly, giving you time to repeat the words after me. And it may be you're here and, you know, it's not that you're opposed to the Christian faith or anything like that, but you just aren't sure that you really are a follower of Jesus. Well, why not be sure this morning? Jesus said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. So that's what we're going to pray now. And here's the prayer. And I'll just pause to give you time to repeat these words after me, just quietly in your own heart. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your love for me. Thank you for your death on the cross for me. I am sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my life now. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Lord, in my life, not my will, but yours be done. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. And Lord, I just pray for everyone who's prayed that prayer this morning. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Keep them close to you. 
And may they become more and more like you each day. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. As the musicians are coming up, I just want to say a couple of things before we sing that wonderful, wonderful hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast. Um, one of the things that I have found again and again in the Christian life is God is ahead of us. I didn't know we were going to be having a morning like this, and yet that was the passage that we were led to for this morning and extraordinarily for this evening. Do you know what we're going to be thinking about this evening? For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. How timely is that? Isn't it amazing how the Lord all the time is a step ahead of us? He's the sovereign God and He holds us fast. Let's really, really think of these words as we stand and sing them together. <laughs>